And just so you know, it's going to be a five minute presentation. So hang in there. We'll be able to look at artwork uh, very shortly. Um, I have renamed the show um, from Repurposed Renew to COVID Repurposed, March 2021. The first month of the onslaught of COVID was a lark, a suspension of daily activities and a pleasant hibernation, maybe a month of wait and see, then life would be back to normal. But life came to a halt in a state of confinement peppered with lack of stimulation, low grade anxiety and general malaise greeted me daily. I found I could tame this excess of emotion by exercising vigorously and reading copiously like never before. I found a place to be every day, but it did not involve making art. After a long summer of looking for a joyful experience, a certain settling in phase of adapting happened and with it an idea formed for an art project for my upcoming show at the Providence Art Club. The idea is not new by any means, but I needed to express my particular COVID circumstances. I set out to photograph the mundane inside of my home and outside my home in a square block radius. Dishes draining became a source of amusement as did rearranging the towel rack into sculptural ensemblages. Outside the forlorn neighborhood alley became a source of entertainment for me with air conditioners jutting out basement windows. Curious haphazard paint jobs on crumbling garages. Who cares, it's only an alley. So boring, but the air conditioners drew my interest and I pondered their inclusion a thousand years from now, protruding out of a landfill like amphora buried in Pompeii. And someday someone would dig the metal box up carry it home and display it as an ancient treasure of art. So if not for COVID, would I have ever thought about this concept of the ordinary being extraordinary? Who spends a whole day looking for air conditioners anyway? I guess I do. However, I was not feeling fulfilled during these capers. I was exhausted, not feeling productive. I nixed the idea in December and pawed my way back into my voluminous flat files with reckless intent, scooping out old prints and old drawings and old paintings on board. I was determined to make art out of whatever was at hand. Demolishing these pieces seemed so fitting. I chose a series of paintings I did right after 9-11, another tumultuous time and they became the object of my demolition. Like COVID, 9-11 blurred my ability to make sense of anything. I will tell you now that I was not conscious of where or how I might go in these 11 new mixed media collage pieces, but I came alive again after months of retreating. I tore and cut up drawings and used a sander to scrape and pull away layers. Surprisingly, out of the chaos I was creating, I found meaning and semblance. Out of COVID came the ability for me to cull moments and fragments and make art out of the condition of isolation and malaise. That being said, I would be remiss if I did not give a bit of background and say a little about the sources for my continual supply of abstract images. Here is a very tiny bit. The Chesapeake summers of my youth provided me with horizontal lines of sea and sky. My father's voluminous library, especially issues of Life magazine, whose pages interrupted my perfect world with photographs of starving Africans and bringing to the forefront issues of disparity at home. It was only natural at this stage of my life, I became attracted to a world that had the quality of being other. 
What fascinated me were the headhunters in the Amazon and the tiny life of the Maasai in Kenya. Yeah, However, at the time, I did not know the impact this childhood curiosity would have on me. In the middle of art school in 1971, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, where I grew up, hosted a huge exhibit under the direction of Rhode Island's very own J. Carter Brown. It brought to life the continent of Africa in an exhibit called African Art in Motion. It shattered all my preconceived notions of sublime line and shape and my originally organized thought patterns of making art. It stirred my senses and changed the way I painted and drew. Spent ahead 20 years and I find myself living in West Africa for 10 years, the desert of Mauritania, the civil war in Liberia and Nigeria, a country so full of life it has been called a cross between Harlem and Calcutta. I was constantly being jostled by the other. Nothing was ever clear cut. The smell of wood fire and fish, thorny landscapes full of joyful, but sometimes terrifying experiences, and then also vibrant, joyful, and celebratory art and theater of dazzling color and intellect, all contrast and contradictions. I felt I had landed. In those summers of living in Africa, we escaped to our island in Canada, which is accessible only by a little power boat. It is a scruffy windswept rock with jagged edges and everywhere you look is a tumbling sea replete with hor horizon lines and other islands. Nothing is ever static. Plenty of time to ponder the here and now in a little red robot, rowboat. The advantages I have had are rough hewn by and large, and it is reflected in my work. Happily so. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Susan. So now we will go through your slides. So I will advance and then if you wanna talk about each piece and just tell me next when you're ready to move forward. And that statement was fantastic, really interesting. Certainly, thank you. Okay, um, there's 11 pieces in this series and this one is called Hidden Cove. And it is um, a background of repeated um, images you can see that look like a flow, a pattern of water flowing in one direction. Um, and that background has two or three layers of paint that's applied with modeling paste. So I can run an eraser or a rubber object through the particular areas to create that pattern of something moving and not static. Um, the center part is a lot of cut up pieces of drawings of mine, which actually I liked, but I was going through kind of a cathartic experience. So I cut a lot of these pieces out, which are actually prints. They're pochoir prints. And as you can see, there's navy blue at the top and another color blue and at the bottom a rocky colored and then that little orange of slip there is called hidden cove and it's a place i went swimming to um, on our island in nova scotia next and if people do have questions just i don't know do it <laughs> yeah you can um, drop them in the chat and i'll be happy to ask them yeah this is another piece and by the way they're all 11 by 14 inches this is another piece that um, I kind of took out of my uh, files and sanded it way down. It was a uh, built up areas all in the background and I sanded it till there was nothing. And then I took some leftover um, acrylic paste I have that I used for the inside of my books and uh, made this very brilliant red sky, which I call it, because I feel this is a horizon line with two islands in on the bottom half. 
Next. This is called Katha, and I'm not sure if Alka, my friend Alka Raza is here. She signed up for this, but she lives in India. Um, so she might not be. Katha is a village I stayed in with my friend Alka a couple of years ago. Um, and this reminds me of the call to prayer, which is right outside the window. And Katha was kind of one of those other experiences and a Life Magazine um, component of my life because the village wasn't anything representative of what we normally see. It was real people and young children gathering water at the well. And it's a very exciting place. Um, so Katha was made by taking a whole bunch of drawings and the ones, most of these I did when I was uh, in a residency at the Vermont Studio Center. And I just took my cutting um, utensils and kept cutting big strips out of these perfectly nice drawings. And as you can see, all the strips are glued into the surface of an old board. Um, and the center part again is cut up pieces of pochoir and um, a little cut up um, piece of a niche in India, which is pretty evident. Next. Um, this is the Swamp and Snow, which is a more recent one. Um, I have a studio out in the country at a, our little country house and um, it was snowing quite a bit out there. It's a little higher elevation than Providence. So I took some old prints, as you can see in the middle, those gray and white things, and I cut those all up in strips. And, and then I just wove the strips together and they are now become the centerpiece of this, which the background is, um, I sanded down um, one of the old 9-11 images and then gessoed it and then sanded it again and then scraped these little lines in so you could see the red background. Next. <clears throat> um, this is Red Sky at Night, another one of those um, horizon lines that I use a lot of. And I had a lot of red paint, so I just used it. Um, I didn't buy anything new for this series at all. Um, everything is repurposed. And um, the bottom images, there's six of them, were also cut out of a, a couple drawings and prints that I'd done. And they're very evocative of the shapes of African flora, kind of big and fluffy and um, nondescript, never perfect, a little imperfect lines. And again, I um, sanded way down on this, the background here, but if you really look closely, you can see the images of maybe a building and fire and things kind of um, falling apart. Okay, next. Um, Pam had a question, Pamela had a question, and she said, Susan, do you visualize the piece before you start or does it evolve as you proceed? Also, do you have certain pieces that are particularly attached to and if so, which ones are you more attached to and why? Um, these pieces um, very much evolve as I'm um, sitting there and sanding down and then going through my drawings and grabbing a whole bunch and putting them up against the board and making decisions on what is going to be part of this particular family at the moment. And um, it's pretty um, unconscious. I'm not really thinking too much about it. I've been making art for a long time. And, um, you know, in a way this comes really natural to me, um, just putting together these collages. Um, I, I don't know if I have a favorite um, or not, but people can tell me if they have a favorite. Mm -hmm. Okay, next. Um, this is Impending Storm. And um, I really loved growing up 
on the Chesapeake Bay. And I also spent time on Nantucket Island. And then our island in Nova Scotia, I, I really get a thrill out of seeing a storm coming and how it roughs the water up and the whole motion of things not being static and being kind of crazy and kind of being that other that's not very calming. So this piece, the center of that is all about that. And as you can see, I cut up a perfectly nice walnut ink drawing and that became the very um, moving part of the bottom. And then of course the red uh, paint, I had a lot of left over. Now, here's the first incident you'll see of what the background of 9-11 paintings look like. Um, and I made this facade of like a building, but I, I made it, you know, not perfect kind of off kilter as it is falling and crumbling, but hopefully people won't think too much into that. Okay, next. Oops, sorry. Oh, you skipped one. No, you didn't. Um, this is King and Queen, and it um, is also a print in the background that looks a lot like a lot of my earth, a lot of my artwork, which is um, kind of mimicking textiles because that's another love of mine. And there's actually a piece of textile here you can see on the right side of the object in the middle. Um, and I cut that out of, again, another piece I had um, drawing that I'd done at the Vermont Studio Center and, and tore that apart. And the king and the queen have these little um, crowns on. And then again, the background is, as you can see, very scarred. This was the effect of the building again, 9-11, but look closely and you'll see how I've um, run a piece of sandpaper over it and made all these little markings um, around the edges. And there's some, also some pochoir pieces on the sides. Okay. And we do have another question. It's um, a, from Pamela as well. And it says, is a part of the other of your depiction of various parts in the world um, with unlikely colors? Um, so she's asking about your use of colors and, and how that relates to your idea of the other. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think, I think the colors for me, um, when I was doing landscape were the, the very subtle, beautiful, soft colors. And then I went to Africa and things kind of changed. So the colors I really like now are more um, organic and like wood fire and smoke. And um, a dairy cloth, which is very dark, dark indigo cloth. Um, I work a lot with brown, as people know, because I walnut ink is one of my um, mediums. So I think, if anything, that other um, element with um, regards to color is um, has all come up through my experience, and especially living in Africa. Thank you. Um, and another question came in from Nancy Gosher Thomas, who said, I noticed that many of your pieces have a woven pattern, either in the background or in the center of interest. Is this something that you bring from your travels or from your background in, uh, or do you have a background in textiles specifically? I don't have a background in textiles, but um, I was living in the textile capital of what I consider the world, Nigeria. So um, I was able to go out and watch people on these hand looms and see very rich cloth and textiles that were extraordinary. And also the textile element um, comes to me through the transference of West African textiles to the Americas. Um, many of you know, I work on pieces about that transference and um, a lot of the tea bag pieces I do, which people are familiar with, are all about the textile trade and um, 
how things are um, put together um, in an orderly manner and a pattern for actually just wearing as a typical garment, not necessarily something that was to be put on the wall as a, as a rich painting. Um, textiles were actually, you know, we go and buy them overseas, but they're, they're things that people wear in their hair and, and shirts and costumes and um, they throw on their beds and wrap their children in. So it's, uh, it's part of that other. Yeah. Uh, and then one more question that came in about this piece was from Alison Bianco, who asked, can you explain a little bit more about the pochoir process? Ah, the pochoir process. I should probably have Carol and Alana talk about that. But um, mm -hmm. so pochoir is um, kind of a turn of the century or into the um, um, early part of the century. Um, graphic um, designs that were used by stenciling um, and the stencils themselves um, were put down on paper and then a, a brush that had a blunt edge to it was used to pick the paint up and stipple the paint into the various areas. So, um, the pochoir is coming into fashion again. And there are a lot of artists that have just begun that process within the last 20 years, actually. Um, so you have to make the stencils, you have to be very precise. And I know, Allison, you use stencils mm -hmm. in your silk screening. So you certainly have, um, you know, the presence to understand this medium. Um, but of course, this one, you can do multiple prints, but oftentimes um, people are doing a very short, limited edition of the pochoir prints. That's I like them because they're very immediate and I'm a very immediate artist now. Thank you, that's excellent. Um, and then another question came in from PA who asked, Susan, where in your, where in your travels would you say influenced your work the most? Oh my God. Um, <laughs> well, I travel quite a bit, um, but certainly not in the last year. Um, and the last big trip I took was to India, which was um, pretty incredible. But I would say, because I lived in Africa, I was able to soak up that experience. And it was a raw experience. It wasn't in game parks. Um, it was in rather um, busy places in Nigeria um, where you had to hold your breath a lot or in, uh, in Liberia where, where my husband and I were part of um, an embassy that was um, sequestered to our compound because of a war going on. So you had to kind of um, take the tidbits of color in and out and find your source there. Um, I did have a nice experience in Liberia, which not many people know of, that on the compound that we lived, we took over the British compound when we were there. Um, and there was a bungalow on the compound that Graham Greene lived in while he wrote um, Journey Without Maps. That became my studio. So it was kind of fun. And uh, Mauritania was interesting. Um, it was, you know, there's nothing there. It's void of trees and life. It's just desert. It's a blank palette. But um, I love my time there. I love the desert people in their long robes and visiting the um, tent encampments and actually seeing nothing because out of nothing, there's a lot more to see when than you would expect. Um, so I, I just liked all those experiences. I like my experience in living here and having met all of you. <laughs> Go 
Go ahead. Have a few more slides. So, um, pod is um, something that comes back and forth in my artwork a lot, and it's that pod shape um, because it has a lot of meaning in Africa. Um, people chew on pods for nutrition, and those shapes are kind of um, insinuate um, the female figure um, in some areas. And again, the whole inside of this piece are old prints that I chopped up and put together. Um, and this one to me becomes very African and I don't know why. Um, and then again, the background is that um, textile window appearance and this one I sanded way back. I like this piece. Is the black in the in the background of the center there, is that ink that's pressed into the incisions that you've made? Is that how you're getting that dark, dark color there? No, that's really dark um, ink. And then um, it's just really dark ink. That's an aqua tint, aqua tint. Aqua type. Great. Can't remember anymore. <laughs> oh, and this one you can see the background really well because I kind of left it. I didn't sand it way down. I like the color a lot. Um, and this piece on top is um, a piece of driftwood I found on the periphery of our island. Um, I used to row around and collect all this stuff and. Um, it didn't serve such a purpose of making a lot of art. And then I brought it home and I painted some stripes on it and dug it out of um, a wood bin. I think I was gonna burn it. And, um, and I glued it onto the top of this painting and thought, ooh, I like this. I think we've got a couple more. Um, this is called Wall and it's, um, sitting in my, on my, in my drawing table out in the country and looking at the wall in front of me. Um, and the um, depiction of the centerpiece again is um, a print that I cut up. And then I've got some um, very dark um, brown um, areas too that are a cut up painting um, with a lot of movement. And this is just kind of staring out the window and the snow and looking at the wall and trying to perceive, perceive exactly what I was seeing at the time. And I've sanded this way back and you can even see some newspaper writing in the background of this because I, um, was reading the New York Times a lot, I guess, during 9-11, like everybody else was. So I was taking the New York Times and um, putting some media on top of these and then rolling it out so you could get the image coming out. Uh, we do have a question that came in from Pamela and she said, it's fascinating that some of your pieces are symmetrical or almost symmetrical and some are much, much less so. Can you comment on that, the, the dynamic between things being symmetrical and not so symmetrical in your work? God, I don't think anything's symmetri symmetrical, <laughs> um, especially after living in Africa, because there's always a little hint of something um, being a little askew or not quite right. Um, and I'm not interested in symmetry, actually. I'm interested in the more organic components um, and being able to be honest about how I feel about that. So I'm not sure where you see symmetry, but thank you, Pamela. Mm -hmm. um, this is Flotsam too. So this is another piece in the middle. Um, that I found on our shoreline in Nova Scotia and um, picked it up and brushed some 
blue paint on the top and then drew some lines in the middle. And then as I was putting together this um, last collage in the series, I think, um, I took some um, old painting that was pretty minimal and cut it up and found this beautiful blue color and smacked it on top of um, one of the 9-11 pieces that I'd sanded way down to you got to the white as you can see. Really like that background. And then I glued this um, piece of wood onto it. And then around the edges is one of my favorite pod images again. And these little images also denote um, scarification marks too, which um, is also in the shape of that pod. And I recall those seeing a lot of that for the first time, not only in Life Magazine, but when um, John Carter, J. Carter Brown um, brought to life this fantastic show I talked about in my talk called African Art in Motion um, and got to see these masks with these wonderful scarification lines around the, the faces. It was quite exciting. Michael, is that the end of the? Let's see. I think we. I, I have one more. Next one. Oh, we have this at the end. Yeah. So, um, thank you. First of all, thank you for going through all your work that's in the show. Um, it's so fascinating to hear about how all these different textures came about, and they really are beautiful pieces that reward a lot of you know coming back and looking at them over and over again. Um, Stephen Dewey added a question to the chat. Um, for anyone else, if you haven't asked a question yet, I encourage you put it in the chat. I'm happy to ask them for you now. Um, Stephen asks, Susan, as the pandemic comes to a close, where do you plan to find your next inspiration towards new art? Maybe you don't have to travel too far from Rhode Island. Uh, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so I was talking to somebody the other day and um, we both decided that the pandemic had changed us. And I'm not quite sure what kind of person I am right now. I'm trying to figure it out. So I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with my art or where I'm gonna go right now. Um, I, I can't, I don't know. I'm, I'm a changed person. I'm a different person. I think we all are. And it would be a nice conversation to talk to everyone about this. Um, so let's just say I'm going to sit on it for a while and mm -hmm. see what comes of it. Um, another question is about how to see the show and how long the show is up. Susan's show has another week left. Um, right now we're open weekdays 12 to 4 p.m. And we are not currently open on weekends for open hours, but if you'd like to come on the weekend, just email me and we can find a time when we can open the gallery for you to see it. I would suggest coming on Thursday or before Thursday um, because we have been taking our shows down on the last Fridays of their run. Um, so, but I'm happy to schedule a private appointment for you. Um, masks are required, obviously, and social distancing is required, but there's plenty of room, even in the Castle Novo Gallery, there's always plenty of room at the art club. So I hope that you'll feel that you can come and, and visit and it, it feels very safe. I'm there every day, so you can definitely come by and, and we can work out uh, a, even a private visit for you if that makes you feel more comfortable. Um, the entirety, all the works that Susan showed us here are also on the art club's website. And if you look at them on our website, you can actually zoom into each one and you can really get nice close-ups and really explore the texture online as well. Um, so another question from Ira, um, from Ira Garber is, the structure of the images, which I really like, show that you have a strong interest in the spatial relationship of the different layers that you're creating. Have you ever experimented with any uh, sculptural pieces? Um, I do sculptural pieces, but on a very small level. I have put together um, some pieces with paper um, sculpture and I kind of like that. Um, I'm not sure if I see myself, um, I do see the work as being sculptural, kind of relief in a way, 
but I'm I'm not sure if I want to go there right now. Um, we'll we'll see. Um, I kind of a very contained person, and I like to do um, very small things. And of course, Patty Tash just said your boxes are great sculptural <laughs> presentation. So I do do I do make boxes. I make a lot of them, and. Um, I, I put little um, rectangles and triangles inside them. And I also cut up old prints to make them. Um, but I, I like containment too. Um, and I like smallness and sometimes sculptural pieces um, make an impact if they're big. Um, and I'm not gonna go and do a big, thing right now mm -hmm. yeah even I, your small one the small ones that you had in little pictures a few years ago were really great they were and they had like these interior spaces in them and they were those were really fun yeah i really i enjoyed doing those and you know i don't know what's wrong with me i'm kind of like a nomad um i like moving around with my art i don't like stick to a formulaic <laughs> um degree of um producing art um I'm just more interested in continuing the process of discovery and finding out what newness is out there and how I can put it together. Um, so it confuses a lot of people, especially gallery um, directors, they're confused by that because I'll one year do something that seems very exciting. And then mm -hmm. the next year I'll take my work and say, um, and this 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 happened like more like 30 or 40 years ago when I was really moving around a lot and living in different mm -hmm. places. And um, you know, I didn't I didn't want to have any rules. I didn't want to have anything that was um, preventing me from seeing where I could go with something. That's great. Um, a question came in from Katie Tompkins who said, "How does it feel to cut up your own past work?" Oh, Katie wouldn't like me to do that. Um, <laughs> it was very cathartic, I have to say. Um, I, I, it, I like my work and I don't get tired of it, but I just held it up and said, um, this is a nice drawing, but let's see where else this, this can go. And um, at the time, because I told you in my talk, how I was feeling a little melancholy, it, it was kind of a catharsis and um, it might've been pent up anger too. Um, that kind of anger that's tamped down, especially for those of us who there are not many out there, a few online I see who were born in the fifties and sixties and were always told, you know, anger's not to be expressed in this house. Um, so I really liked cutting these pieces up. And I was particular though, I cut up only areas that I thought would enhance my artwork. And I really cut up colors that I liked and colors that I didn't like, I, I would just put aside um, and not use. So this is a very weird time, I have to say um, for me and it was like anything goes. If I cut these up, I'm not gonna miss them. I'm just gonna move on. That's great. I think it's a, it's a it seems like a fun experiment and it's brave too, to say, okay, I'm gonna destroy this one thing to create something else. Um, Alison Bianco said, going through this past year, did you end up feeling that art making was therapeutic for you? Um, only towards the end when I discovered this cathartic experience and putting together these um, really crazy going everywhere collages did I feel that, Allison. Um, be interesting to hear what other artists have to say at some point about this as well. You know, especially young artists. I mean, where are you guys in this? You know, just starting off and doing beautiful work and then COVID came, I, I'd, I'd like to know actually how other people feel. Maybe Michael, you could have a whole discussion about that. We should, I think that would be interesting. 
Um, another question that we had was from Angel, who really enjoys the backgrounds of your pieces. You spoke a lot about the backgrounds and, and how you do make different marks with them. Um, and Angel was sort of asking sort of materials questions. Are you working primarily in oil or acrylic? Do you, I, you spoke about the acrylic medium and things like that, but do you ever use oil or are these primarily acrylic based? Um, Angel, they're all acrylic. And I can see why you might like the backgrounds because of the wax work you do. Um, yeah, um, I haven't worked in oil since I went to art school in the early 1970s. Uh, it's acrylics a, for me a much quicker result. And it's um, it's forgiving too, as, as everybody knows, you can mm -hmm. kind of scrape it away. And Have you ever worked in encaustic at all? I have, I'm pretty, I'm pretty bad at it. And uh, <laughs> it falls all over the floor and all over my shoes and sprays everywhere. And um, I think you have to be a little bit neat when you're working in encaustic. And uh, yeah, I tend not to be that neat when I get moving. <laughs> um, a comment for Susan from Pamela. Uh, Pamela said, you are so spontaneously creative and at the same time you can talk about uh, and bring and present and explain your pieces to the viewers in a most intellectual way. You are so unusual and give us that permission to approach life in the ways you present it, your constant renewal and your explorations. So that was just a nice comment from Pam. Oh, I would say that's a really good comment. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and as we, I think we are, we're sort of, we, well, we have a few more minutes left. Does anyone have any more questions? If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and I'm happy to read them for you. Um, I think that Susan did a really excellent job of explaining, you know, all those fantastic textures and layers that are going on in these pieces. Um, a question I was thinking of was, since so many of these are using those 9-11 um, paintings that you were talking about. Were those paintings originally the same scale, that 11 by 14, or did you like saw the panels down and, and totally re, you know, repurpose them? No, they're all the 11 by 14s. That was the original size, yeah. Because I, uh, I do have a couple left, so um, I kept them. I didn't destroy all of them. Yeah. But they, they originally um, had the, um, inside pieces that were contained were abstract images that um, connoted the people jumping out of the buildings. And I kind of wanted to get rid of that. Yeah. Well, I think it's a, I think the new series is really excellent. It's a great show. It's really, it's beautiful. It's very quiet and it gives everyone an opportunity, I think, to sort of reconsider. And it, it actually, the, the title is very appropriate because it's very renewing to, I think, to look at it. Um, if anyone has any last questions, I will allow you or I'll ask the last question. Okay. Um, I would say my, my last question for every artist that we do these talks with is what are you working on right now? And what are you looking forward to working on next? Um, I'm not working on anything right now. I'm going to be part of a, um, a writer's workshop for a month. And um, it's run by a poet in San Francisco. So I will be, um, I'll be getting prompts daily and I will um, be writing for a while and just seeing what I, what I come up with. Um, and sometimes that will help open me up to something new. Um, I also make art books and I want to start that process again because I really, really like that. I like the surprise of opening a book and pulling out an accordion and seeing lots of different images. Um, so I think I'm going to start doing that too. I'm going to give myself a little break and, and do the writing thing for a while. Um, does that help you, Michael, at all? Yes. Yeah, that's great. That's very cool. Um, so I'll just say thank you one more time, Susan. That was really excellent. Your talk was great and seeing each of these artworks with you was wonderful. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us. Again, if you'd like to come see the show, you all have my email. Please send me an email. We'll be happy to set up a special time for you if you wanna come in a morning or sometime 
on your own to see the show, we can definitely make that happen for you. And, and we will make this video available. It'll be available on the club's YouTube. So if you want to watch it again, you'd be very welcome to as well. So thank you all. Thank you, Susan. Um, and have a great night, everybody. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. I can see all of your faces near and far. Love you. Bye. Thanks. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Susan and Michael. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Alana. Good night. <laughs>